What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host. We are going to take a look at the Monday Night Football game for week two. Joining us, Jordan Najani of CBS Sports. What's up, buddy? Hey, Will Brinson. Glad to be on. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing better now that I get to see this uh, delightful jacket that you're wearing. People should go to Pick 6, jeez, uh, youtube.com slash pick 6 podcast is that right Devo? what is it youtube.com slash pick six or pick six podcast i'm losing it man okay don't tell me uh-huh. <laughs> it's uh, yeah i mean pick six, go ahead uh youtube.com slash picks it is youtube.com slash pick six man monday morning starting off starting off hot uh you can subscribe there if you listen to the podcast please go subscribe we we're trying to win a pizza party you can watch all of our uh shows on there as well uh, we have, of course, the Picks, the Picks podcast. We also have a, a YouTube exclusive for early week three lines that you can get on. You can go watch the, uh, the, Steve, the Steve DeBerg loudspeaker shoulder story, as told by Randy Cross on there. And you can see Jordan's incredible jacket, which features palm trees and flamingos. I don't even – are you – have you worn that in a serious setting before? And or is that something that you – like? like what's the story behind the jacket? Yeah, absolutely. I've worn this in a serious setting several times. And to be honest with you, it's my gambling jacket. That's what I call it. And of course, Monday Night Football is out here in Vegas. This kind of has a South Florida feel, I guess, to it. But but to me, it's my Vegas jacket. So okay. ready to get going. All right, I like it. Well, let's talk about the game that is happening on Monday night. The Saints are at the Raiders, the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, they open up the new stadium there in Vegas. The over-under 48 and a half. The, uh, the Saints... Minus five and a half. The money line minus two thirty. The Raiders plus one ninety five. All right, I'm gonna start with you with this. This is a uh, before we get into the game. I'm curious what you think about this because I had a, a podcast listener email me. I don't know how he actually got my work email, which is terrifying. Uh, but he's a, a Nick Corbett um, in Toronto. I guess he's communicated with somebody from FFT before and, and, and guessed it. He listens to both of the podcasts. Appreciate you listening, Nick. He is currently nine for nine on a ten team parlay. The final leg of the parlay conveniently is the saints money line so the question he asked me was do i hedge and you're the man in the flamingo jacket what would you do if the payout if uh, if he doesn't do anything pays out uh like a just under twelve hundred dollars for the for the 10 team parlay so guessing is you know like i don't know what the math is there but i'm guessing it's like you know five bucks on a 10 team parlay that if it hits bang so is this the thing we saw on the sports line Twitter account? Is this the same scenario? Because we had something that was similar where a guy had a chance to hedge because his last leg is Saints money line, but I think he's in line to win a lot more money. E- either way, same scenario. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Mike Palm on Instagram. No, th- this guy had, oh my, oh my goodness. This guy uh, put 50 bucks down and it looks like he picked every one, two, three, four, five, six, every game against the spread, no, every game on the money line, hit him. The- 15 team parlay what, what game do you leave off just didn't feel like messing with the, the Bengals and the, they didn't bet so every game except for the Bengals and Browns on Thursday night he put all the Sunday games and all the Monday games he correctly picked the winner of every single game in fact he correct did every favorite win yesterday I don't yes, think I'm not every, sure he picked it did every favorite win every favorite one outright interesting wow. so he picked every favorite to win yesterday and now just needs the Saints to, uh, to complete the parlay for $8,790. He can cash out for 6120 So what would you do? Would you let it ride? Would you cash out? Would you hedge? What's your play? Yeah, so I saw that tweet last night, and, you know, I, I actually had to sit down and think about it. But since I'm wearing the Flamingo jacket and we want to get out there aggressive, having the Raiders' money line is not a bad bet in any way. So I would let it ride for sure. Having the Saints' money line, you mean, is not a bad bet. Oh, sorry, yeah. Saints. Yeah. Yes, Saints' money line. Yeah, I mean, like, if you're this guy who – so, like, you're, you're basically getting a minus 260. You're juicy – like, it's minus 260, which is a I – mean, that's a lot. You have to lay 260 bucks to win 100 bucks, And instead, you're getting it – and now it's cranking up the value to, you know, whether it's 8790 or $1,200. What I would do, Jordan, is I would take – because you have the favorite in the parlay, I would go and bet X amount on the Raiders' money line. And then that way you kind of guarantee yourself – you know, some, uh, you know, you guarantee yourself some profit because you can go and bet a hundred bucks. Now you could also, I mean, in theory, you could bet a hundred bucks on the Raiders plus five and a half and try and window it. Like I don't hate either one. I like the idea of, of hedging out a little bit 
So like, I'm not, I would like, I wouldn't want to lose money on this proposition. You know what I'm saying? Like this guy put 50 bucks down. I'm definitely at least putting 50 bucks on the Raiders money line. And since they're two to one at home on Monday night football, I'm probably putting like 200 bucks on them. And at, at bare minimum, or like if, if I got this massive parlay, the one that looks like it could really pay out, I'd probably put 500 on them and then letting it come back where it's like worst case scenario, you know, I'm winning a thousand dollars. That's very fair. And yeah, I guess you are hedging it in some way, but at the same time, you're not going to get the same rush watching that game. Right. <laughs> knowing that, knowing that it was Raiders versus Saints, you need the Saints to win to win $8,000. Yeah. Right. I, I need, I need that rush. I, I would keep it rolling. Yeah. Now the other, the other option too, is like, if the saints score early, like if the saints score first, you go and hit the Raiders money line then. And it's like, and then maybe you'll get them at like 400 you know, plus 400 or something like that. It's, it, it, I would, I'm probably at least, ha- I'm taking a little chunk out of it if it's me. So Nick, my advice to you as I emailed back would be to uh, make sure you're going to get some kind of money out of this. Cause you got to, you hit a, a 10 team parlay. Like you got nine or 10, Get some cash out of it. When do the last one is the dog? That's crazy, though, that all the favorites won. All right, let's get to the actual game. How do you think it plays out? Michael Thomas out with an ankle injury, ankle sprain. He was going to try and force it. It was ridiculous. Uh, Marcus Davenport out with an elbow injury. Trent Brown currently doubtful with a calf injury. And Henry Ruggs questionable with a knee injury. Um, I think, obviously, the Michael Thomas injury is enormous for the Saints. I mean, he's their, you know, their most important offensive player besides Drew Brees, I guess. Maybe Alvin Kamara. Uh, what, how do you see these injuries impacting this game? Yeah, obviously the Michael Thomas injury is a pretty big one. But at the same time, I think I have enough confidence in, in the Saints offense to kind of get the job done in prime time now on this awesome stage in Vegas. And to be honest with you, it wasn't like Michael Thomas was – a huge part of the game plan in week one against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I, I like that in, in the fact that maybe it brought down the line a little bit to five and a half. So I'm going to jump on that to give away my pick already. So they have some other weapons on offense. Alvin Kamara is finally healthy. We can get into that later. Now, when it comes to Marcus Davenport, that's a kid who I like. I thought he was prime for a really big season. Now he's missed two games, but that Trey Hendrickson guy, is probably going to get the start in his place. He's going to get more playing time. He had a solid week one, four tackles and a sack. He knows how to get after the quarterback. So I don't think that this is necessarily a huge injury. Uh, Now, I don't know an update on Henry Ruggs, but that's another really important one because I went back and watched the film against the Panthers last week, and they did a lot of fun stuff with him, whether it was an end around, they even ran an option with him. And then, of course, he was the primary option when they wanted to take shots downfield. So John Gruden has a lot of fun with this kid. I expect that to continue as soon as he's healthy. And even if he does play, the question obviously remains, how healthy is he? Is he still going to be used in the the same capacity in terms of taking shots downfield with this young speedster out of Alabama? So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Definitely keep your eye out for reports on that one yeah i mean i think with rugs what you see is um you also see with uh you know with josh jacobs they want to john gruden wants to feed his first round picks um he wants to make sure you know i mean he he compared josh jacobs to walter payton and you know he wants he the usage for henry rugs in week one against carolina was through the roof i mean they until he hurt his ankle i think they were rolling him out there. I mean, they were putting him in, in every possible position to succeed. John Gruden wants you to know that the guys that he drafted in the first round are good. Like, he doesn't want to bring them along slowly. He wants them to be impact guys for you. And it's sort of a, like a – not a PR campaign, but I mean, a little bit of that. And so I do think if Ruggs plays, he will be a big part of the offense. If he doesn't, uh, you know, it's tough, man. They, I mean, they're going to have to try to pound the ball against, uh, you know, against a Saints defense that I think is very underrated. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, like to your point, I mean, Josh Jacobs, 25 carries, 93 yards, three rushing touchdowns, and he wants to be more involved in the passing game. I think he set a, a, a mark for himself and how many receptions he wants to catch this year. I forget what that was, but four for 46 last week. He kind of took advantage of some breakdowns in the middle of the field. So maybe that's something that John Gruden likes to do a little more in week two, try to get involved in the pass game. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, I think you're exactly right. He wants these guys, these first round picks to be touted early and often. He wants them to be the reason that his team finds success. Derek Carr, by the way, has actually been pretty good against the spread in his uh, career in primetime. It's kind of surprising eight, five and two uh, against the spread in primetime games and seven, two and one against the spread in primetime games at home in his career. Obviously those qualify as games, 7 PM Eastern or later uh, New Orleans, uh, just looking at trends. 13-3 and three against the spread on the road since 2018. The best mark in the NFL over that stretch. They have won and covered seven straight road games. That is wild. I mean, that, is, that is really impressive. Um, and looking at new stadiums, 
I don't know there's a huge trend for it. We only have two recent games with the Chargers and the Rams when they relocated uh, to Los Angeles. The Chargers lost and did not cover the Rams one by six, actually, against uh, – no, it wasn't against the Raiders because they were not at home for that game. Who did they play? I can't remember who they played in week one. But anyway, they won. The Cowboys, um, Rams, Cowboys. Cowboys, Rams, that might be right, yeah. Um, I don't know. Does that count? No, well, that's no. So I think it, I think it's in the stadium too. So it's weird. Like it's it's the Coliseum. So it's not like the the first week of the season. Anyway, um, what do you think? You going with uh, you going with the Saints here? Yeah, that's an interesting trend. And I wanted to come on here and say, well, all these games had like had crowd members there. They had a new audience, so at a new place that was all energized and ready to go. But then that's you look charging. back in the past past two couple of weeks, and Justin Herbert had a great game covered last covered last night, and then of course uh, the Rams beat the Cowboys outright. Uh, on Monday Night Football in week one. So uh, that trend is not going in my direction. But you already mentioned those two stats about New Orleans, 13-3 and three against the spread. They're on the longest active streak in the NFL when it comes to covering seven straight road games. So with the spread being five and a half right now, active on William Hill Sportsbook, I'm going to roll with the Saints. Yeah, I'm going with the Saints too. Uh, a little hesitant because I think the dogs – have been have been live against the spread this week, and I think I had probably had too many favorites. You know, Tampa Bay covered. They they broke off a long touchdown run to to, to cover you know in, in BS fashion. The Chiefs struggled to get it done. Uh, there, you know, we did see the Ravens, but I think the Saints. My my theory, Jordan, on this is the Chiefs and the Chiefs. Look, the Chargers came out and played a great game, and you know, tip your cap to them. Uh, but the the Ravens, the Saints, and the Chiefs are just three teams I'm not interested in fading right now because I think they are really consistent. They are locked in, and I don't know that the Raiders, even without Michael Thomas, have enough firepower to slow down uh, the Saints on offense. So I will also take the Saints. Uh, coming up, we'll tell you what player props to take uh, after the break. So player props, obviously a big part of the modern-day NFL gambling scene. Uh, what, are you, what are you looking at in terms of props for this matchup between the Raiders and the Saints? So since I was creating the gambling guide for CBS Sports, I've been kind of looking over these player props over the past few days. One that I grabbed and published um, over this weekend that is now off the board, surprisingly enough, is Alvin Kamara, total rushing touchdowns. The line was at a half, 0.5, and that was at plus 190. Now he scored two, he only scored five rushing touchdowns, I think, last season, but it was pretty clear he was not healthy at all. He was hampered by injuries. He had a rushing touchdown and receiving touchdown in week one. He was also being featured kind of as the goal line back, which was surprising enough. So I jumped on Alvin Kamara plus 190 to score one rushing touchdown. This morning I checked to, to update that piece, and that was off the board now. Mm. Um, so I had to pick another Kamara prop, and I found a kind of a double result one where Alvin Kamara and Jared Cook to score touchdowns. So obviously I believe that the Saints are going to score more than 14 points in this game. Uh, Jared Cook led the Saints in receiving last week, and he's a former Raider as well. I believe that Alvin Kamara is going to score a touchdown and Jared Cook can get one as two. That's at plus 350, so I was intrigued by that. Um, another one I want to throw at you is I'm keeping in the rushing game for the Saints. So Latavius Murray, his over-under total rushing attempts – is at 8.5, and mm. I grabbed this this weekend at plus 100, and now it's minus 115. So last year he averaged a little over nine rushes per game. You can argue those stats are inflated because of Kamara's health or lack of health, I guess. But he did lead the Saints in rushes and rushing yards against the Buccaneers, 15 for 48. So what I took away from that is that he's a legitimate part of this offense. I think he's going to clear nine carries, especially if New Orleans jumps out to an early early lead and they need to chew up clock. Kamara wasn't necessarily the, the bell cow. Maybe in the offense he could be considered that because of the, what he does in the receiving game. But in terms of rushing attempts, that was Latavius Murray last week. So 8.5 is a low over under, in my opinion. I'm jumping on the over there. All right. I like, uh, speaking of Kamara, I like the over on receiving yards, 38 and a half. Um, I would anticipate you know, he had five receptions last week. The Raiders only gave up uh, four or three catches to Christian McCaffrey, who was really more featured as, as a runner. He had 23 carries uh, and just four targets and, and three receptions. But I think with the absence of Michael Thomas, you'll see Alvin Kamara involved in the passing game a lot more. They could be like, I think what they'll like, they're not just going to, okay, we don't have Michael Thomas. Let's replace him with Traycon Smith. You know, like that's not, that's not what they'll do. What they'll do is 
probably use Latavius Murray in the backfield more, split Alvin Kamara out and diversify the passing game uh, by, by allowing Kamara to be a big factor in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in you know, catching the ball. So in my opinion, I think what you want to do is maybe target some of these Kamara passing props because I think he'll be more involved in it as a result of that absence. Um, I don't know. Five, over five and a half receptions is a lot, but just plus 125. If it were four and a half, I would love that over. I would be a little hesitant to take the, the five and a half, but I do think they could feed him in the passing game you know, with, with Michael Thomas out. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders, over four and a half rece- receptions at William Hill is plus 120. I'll take that. I mean, like, again, he's not going to just replace Michael Thomas. But, I mean, you know, he's, they're gonna, they'll use him on those slant options that, that you always see Thomas run. I like the over on that spot. Yeah, and the slants was the slant was a good pattern that the Raiders actually ran against uh, the Panthers last week as well. So, and like you said, he's not going to exactly replace the kind of production that Michael Thomas brings to the table, but he is going to be that new number one wide receiver. And he only had I think three catches last week. He started to get featured a little more in the offense as the second half rolled along. But yes, I think he does replace Thomas as the number one wide receiver. That's an interesting prop. I would hop on that as well with you. And you went going back to Kamara for a sec. He had five catches last week, which was tied for a team high with Jared Cook. So if he if he truly is going to get more reps where he split out wide, then he could clear that over. Yeah. Uh, what On the Raiders side, anything stand out to you? I love the uh, the idea right now. So, like, you can take this on William Hill right now. And it'll I would assume – so they don't have Henry Ruggs props up because he's questionable, right? You're not going to put a prop up for Ruggs and then everybody bangs the under and then he's – you know, he doesn't play. Uh, if he does play, if he's active, then you'll see that – you'll see him pop up, I would assume, right before game time. Maybe not, but Darren Waller, over 47 and a half receiving yards. Um, without Henry Ruggs, Waller is going to be a major factor in this passing game, and Derek Carr loves to dump it down to Waller when, when things aren't going well. He's a safety valve, and I cannot imagine him being under 50 receiving yards. Plus, whether the Raiders are winning or losing, like if the Raiders are involved in a shootout with the, the Saints, Waller is going to be catching a bunch of passes. If the Raiders are getting blown out, they're going to dink and dunk their way to Waller all the way down the field. So I don't really understand why it's that low. I mean, I guess you can't put him at 60 or anything like that. Uh, I like his overall receptions at four and a half too. Now, if Ruggs ends up playing, this could flip on you. But I, I just think the way that they utilize uh, Waller in this passing game, it's hard not to like his overs in these spots. I'm certainly with you on the over for receptions. Now he had six for 45 last week. You know, he didn't exactly stretch the field by any means of the imagination. Not that that's his main role on offense. Right. So I'm a little questionable on the, on the receiving yards for the one prop I did have for the Raiders. It's actually Derek Carr total passing completion under 23 and a half. Mm. So according to sports line, data scientist, Stephen L uh, his projected stats are around 21.2 completions, 239 yards, 1.4 touchdowns. So he expects Carr to hit this under. Um, he completed 25 or more passes only six times last season. So it's not something that happens more often than not. And even though Las Vegas trailed Carolina in the fourth quarter last week, Carr still completed only 22 passes, I think. So, and just another thing po- that's worth pointing out is that while the Saints as a whole did not really play well against the Buccaneers in their season opener, I thought the secondary did. I mean, yeah. Tom Brady only completed 23 passes through a couple picks. I think C.J. Garner-Johnson led the team in tackles or something crazy. So I- I'm going to stick with the under 23 and a half completions for Derek Carr. Uh, one, more, one more prop that I'll throw out there, and then we'll get to DFS, but uh, uh, Josh Jacobs is considered not necessarily a great receiving back. Uh, coming out of college and everybody, you know, they're like, oh, they'll use Jalen Rashard. They'll use all these other guys uh, in the passing game, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he had six targets for four catches and 46 receiving yards uh, against the the Panthers in week one. That is a, like, I don't, we were talking with Nando DeFino on the, the the Fantasy Football Today Twitch stream. He thinks like he would take Jacobs, if we were redrafting right now, he'd take Jacobs like third overall. I don't know how that I'm quite that high, but I do think that six targets and four catches in week one shows that John Gruden wants him to be a multifaceted back. I don't know that the prop number on this is necessarily caught up. It is two and a half. Now it's juiced to the over at minus 135, but I really like the idea of, 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 betting on Jacobs over in receptions and over in receiving yards, which is not a huge number at all either. We've got uh, 17 and a half for the over there. I mean, that's if he catches three passes, he's going over 17 and a half yards. I just think that right now Jacobs is being treated as a run, like a, you know, a, a, a 
a traditional old school back and he is being involved in the passing game because Gruden wants him to get the accolades, you know, for the first round pick. So I like the over from, uh, from Josh Jacobs there. No, that's a great eye by you. I totally agree with you. Like you said, if he catches three, three passes, he's definitely going over that 17 and a half mark or whatever it is. So I'm totally on board with that. I'm going to hammer that as well. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's look at DFS. So for showdown purposes, obviously we only have one game uh, in this slate. But, you know, you pick, we're going to look at DraftKings. You pick a captain. Uh, Alvin Kamara, the top-ranked guy at 17-1. Drew Brees, 15-9. Michael Thomas still priced up because of their algorithm, but he's out. Don't use him. Josh Jacobs, 14-4. Derek Carr, 13-8. And then you get to Emmanuel Sanders, uh, 13-2. Jared Cook, 12 even. And Darren Waller, 11-1. Henry Ruggs at 10-2. I don't know that I can make Ruggs my captain. Uh, you have to be ready to have a, a pivot. Like, now, the one thing you can do, if Ruggs, if Ruggs is going to play, he will be – crazy under in the showdown jordan so you could potentially pit, like you could potentially get some leverage on the field by being able to go with henry ruggs as your captain if you think he's going to get a ton of usage uh, i would anticipate the three the, the four most highly owned guys are going to be the two running backs kamara jacobs Carr, and breeze i would not be surprised at all if jacobs is more owned than Carr because uh, more than Kamar, excuse me, because you're saving $3,000 on the captain spot and it makes it a lot harder to fit everybody into that. Um, so if we, if we think the Saints are going to win and we think the Saints are going to get downhill um, and, and, and what a good build here, if you think Alvin Kamara is going to be the feature guy in this offense this week, you go Kamara at captain um, and then you can drop in. If we think the Saints are going to blow him out, you go with Latavius Murray, who you sneak in there. He is a dirt cheap, $3,400. Maybe the Saints are up big and he gets 15 carries. Uh, and then you go with Derek Carr and you add in some Darren Waller because he'll be chasing points. And uh, let's see, I think we can fit Drew Brees. And that leaves us with 2,300 left. Now, here's an interesting build, too. You can either go with Taysom Hill at 2,200. Do we think Taysom Hill is going to be active? I don't know if I love it. Or you go with Jalen Richard at 1,400. And then you're like, you're kind of, you're basically completely fading Josh Jacobs, who will be one of the most popular players on the slate. I don't mind that as a contrarian build here. So now you have 900 left. That doesn't really matter how much you leave in these showdown contests. You're, you're basically banking on Breeze to Kamara, light up the scoreboard, Latavius Murray melting clock, and then Derek Carr dumping off to Jalen Richard and, and, uh, and Darren Waller as they try to chase points. And that's sort of the build that you're going with there, which I don't think would be that shocking of a game script. Yeah, I'm with you. And you know a lot more about this DFS than I do. But just looking at these sleepers, I mean, Taysom Hill could be kind of an intriguing option if you are strapped for cash and your salary cap build. He, I mean, he got the first touch of the game last game, I believe, in week one. And he obviously he had a few good rushes as well. Another guy is Deontay Harris. Uh, if, if Mike, he's not going to step in for Michael Thomas, of course, but he was a return specialist turned legitimate offensive weapon now. We had a few really good touches in week one against the Buccaneers. So if you're strapped for cash, you're going big on the captain, then Deontay Harris is someone to keep an eye on as well. Yeah, and, and I would say this. If you go with Jacobs as your, uh, as your captain, so we were able to get Breeze and – uh, Breeze and Carr. I don't think I want anything to do with the defenses here. I mean, there's a chance this is a defensive. There's no chance it's a defensive game, right? I don't know if I define it as that. I mean, I, I I I can see how the under would hit for sure, and maybe the maybe the Saints defense steps up, so maybe the Saints defense would be an option. Yeah, you could go. You could go with Saints defense. I mean, like if you want to go crazy contrarian, in because again, forty eight and a half total. Saints defense is seventy eight hundred for the captain. And you can basically go Saints defense and then jam in anybody, you know, anybody else that you want, uh, more or less. You know, you can go Saints defense, get Breeze, Carr, Jacobs, and Kamara. It leaves you a 1,400 to mess around with, and you can go with Jalen Richard there. Um, I, it's going to be tough if you want to go. This does feel like a situation where you can fit everybody in at the top that you need. So I would tell people to be careful that, you know, if you can, if you, because with Michael Thomas out, there's not going to be very many pivots. Like, Michael, Michael Thomas being out and Henry Ruggs possibly being out, if both those guys are out, everybody, you know, it shrinks your possible puzzle pieces that you're putting together. So you have to be a little bit careful there, and that's why you might want to go contrarian. But if you think it's just going to be an old-fashioned shootout, you know, avoid the defenses and, and hope you hit on the one. So, like, last night in the, um, in the, Saint, in the, in the Seahawks-Patriots game, the winning lineup, like, I cashed in a showdown, and, but the winning lineup um, in the, uh, the Sunday night showdown was Cam Newton at captain, which I – so, like, I had Cam Newton at captain, and then it was Russell Wilson, Julian Edelman, Inkeel Harry, and then you needed to have David Moore and Demarius Bird. 
So that was, that was the winning lineup. And there were like 37 people who tied it first and won 15 grand in that, you know, in that lineup. But it's like, you know, that's sort of a, I don't want to say status quo, but if there's, if there's 37 people tying for first place, it means that that lineup is, is probably not obvious, but fr- probably, you know, like I think there's a similar situation if we lose some of the guys uh, to, to, you know, to injury, Michael Thomas and Henry Ruggs, I think you can end up seeing a bunch of ties. So you got to think about how to differentiate, differentiate yourself that way, but maybe it's just a shootout and those guys end up being good. We'll see. Um, all right. Any last thoughts before we get out of here? No, I'm very excited for this one. It's two one and no teams. So, uh, We'll we'll try to see if the Saints can kind of get back on the Super Bowl road here. It's a new environment in Vegas. Maybe this kind of knocks the cobwebs loose. All right, Jordan, appreciate it, buddy. Uh, Follow him on Twitter, read him on CBSSports.com. Talk to you soon, pal.